health and safety system. And it's very important to follow that. And it's very important to have a compliance system in place in any organization that we are working. So that's very important. So we have usually in a framework of legal requirements, acts, health and safety regulations, code of practices, standards and guidance notes. So in this standard, they talk about legal and other requirements. Legal requirements coming from government, any type of government. It could be the central government, it could be municipality, it could be province, state, whatsoever, depending on the country where you are. And we have something called codes, codes of practice, and we have standards, guidance notes, labor organization requirements, international regulations that a country has signed for, accepted to adopt and and uh, implement in the country. So all these requirements are supposed to be in place. So usually it's very important to do this. Uh, so we talked earlier about the near miss in the study 630, uh, 10 and one. In the ISO 45001, they, they uh, have a, a term called incident. So the incident in 45001 is divided into three categories accident, near miss, and emergency situation. So the incident, first is, incident is any event that may cause harm or may not cause harm or may cause emergency. So if you have an accident, which is one type of incident, uh, accident means there is injury, so we are harmed, or there is sickness. If you have near miss, it means there is an incident, it's a type of incident where there's no harm or injury. So you're not harmed, you're not injured. This is called near miss. And you might have something called emergency situation. That's a, a different, different type of incident. So we need to have, so we need to identify hazards and risks, control them, identify legal and other requirements, and we need to have something called incident investigation. So if an incident happened, and as I said, incident could be an accident where injury or harm is there, could be a near miss where there's no injury or harm, or could be an emergency situation where we have to act immediately. So when we have incident, we need to do incident investigation. So we need to adopt a joint approach, all of us in the organization, investigate in a timely manner. We need to investigate the incident very quickly. You don't wait for a long time. Investigate uh, the incident in an open way, honest and objective. So we don't blame people, we blame the system. Okay, avoid blame, investigate the root cause. What is the root cause of the incident? Key steps in the investigation process, information gathering. We see what happened, when it happened, how it happened, okay, and where it did not happen. And then we go to analyze what happened, and then we do uh, root cause analysis during analysis, and then we put controls measures and make an action plan for the incident so it will not happen again and implement the action plan. And that's very important to do this. Now, the structure of the uh, 45001 is like any other standard today published by ISO organization. ISO organization being the international organization standardization they develop international standards and they have adopted a common structure for all management system standards based on 10 sections or 10 clauses. Section one, scope. Section two, normative reference or clause two. Section three, terms and definitions. Section four, context of the organization. Section five, leadership. Section six, planning. Clause seven, support. Section eight, operation. Section nine, performance evaluation and section 10 uh, monitoring measurement and improve uh, sorry continual improvement section 9 is the performance evaluation monitoring measuring and analysis and section 10 is continual improvement so a management system standard now published by iso organization will have these 10 clauses they are all the same it doesn't matter what management system we are talking about quality environment has and safety risk management information security uh, food safety management system, uh, continued continue, uh, continue, uh, business whatsoever, uh, continuity information, uh, continuity management system, uh, IT management system, educational management system. They all have the same ten clauses: one, two, till ten. One mean the scope. You will always have the scope. Normative reference terms and definition three and four, five, six until ten. 
Scope of the standard provides context and background. Every standard has a scope. It tells you why this standard is going to be implemented. And 45001, as I said, is to protect workers. That's very important. The scope of the standard does include protecting property, but there's nothing wrong in using it to protect property. You can, at the same time, protect workers and protect property. That's very important. And normative reference, in 45001, there is no normative reference, terms and definitions. And they tell you on the standard when they use the word shall, it means mandatory. When they use the word should, it means recommended. May is permissible, can, you can do it. So here are the 10 sections of the standard, one to 10. And this standard is like any other standard based on EDCA, plan, do, check, act. So here they is section four and five and six are the planning part. Section 8 is the doing part, section 9 is the checking part, and section 10 is the acting part, and support is there for all the plan, do, and check, and act. Section 7 is a support section, supporting, planning, doing, checking, and acting. So the system is based on process approach these days, like uh, all management system standards. So a process means you have input for the process and you have output for the process. So input could be the occupation has and safety hazards, objectives of the organization in regards to health and safety requirements, specification, legal requirements. Now to do a process, you need people. They must, they must be competent, have skills and knowledge, and they must be trained. Uh, you need materials, equipment, and physical environment, what and where defined and approved, maintained and tested, hierarchy of control applied. You need output, finished good or service, result, and you have unharmed work. So the main output of an occupation health and safety management system is unharmed work. When we say unharmed, mean they don't have injuries and they don't have illness. So we have to be careful. So the main objective is to protect workers from injuries and from ill health, to so prevent injuries and health. That's very, very important in the occupation health and safety management system 45001. And then you do measures and you have methods on how to do the work. So any process approach will need the people, will need the materials, will need the input, will need the output, will need measures, and we need the method of work. So that's plan, do, check, act, structure. And the standard is based on risk-based thinking, that we do everything based on risk. It's very important. And risks are mainly determined in clause four and clause six. So in section four of the standard, they ask us to do the context of the organization 4.1, uh, 4.2, understanding the needs and expectation of interested parties, 4.3, determining the scope where the system will be implemented, and 4.4, the occupational health and safety management system processes. Understanding the context of the organization, internal and external context in regards to health and safety. What our context internally, what issues internally that we need to worry about in regards to health and safety? Do we have the infrastructure? Do we have the people? Do we have the policies? Do we have the objectives? Do we have the procedures? So kind of making a survey of your organizations in regard, internally in regards to health and safety issues, and do we have them? One way of doing is to make a gap assessment between what you have and what are the requirements of the standard internally and see if you have them. What Some people, they do SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, and threats. That's very nice, okay? But it has to be geared towards health and safety. We need to check if we have the health and safety. So hazards in the organization, these are internal issues, physical hazards, chemical hazards, ergonomic hazards, psychosocial hazards, and biological hazards, and botanic hazards. These are internal issues. How we deal with those hazards? Okay, we know how we deal with those hazards. Are those hazards identified? This is an internal issue that you need for. This is part of internal context. The external context uh, is political situation, economical situation, social situation, legal situation, environmental situation, uh, economy. Uh, and technology. These are external issues related to health and safety. What are the new legislation for health and safety? What are the new technology for health and safety? How we can do these things? These are very important uh, to uh, understand internal and external context. Any issue, the issue in the organization is something that's already in place. It's not 
something that might happen or might not happen, it's already in place. And this already in place, it could be a risk or it could be an opportunity. 4.2, understanding the needs, uh, 4.2, understanding the needs and expectation of workers and other interested parties. You see here, we need workers are part of interested parties, but the standard wanted to emphasize on workers and say understanding the needs and expectation of workers. Why? Because the whole scope of the standard is to protect workers and prevent their injuries and their ill health. So we make a list of interested parties, including workers, and check what they need. And this list, we can check who is important and give a weight for every interested party and what are their needs and expectations and how we put them in our place. Uh, part of that is government and legal requirements and how we manage legal requirements. Determine the scope of the health and safety, where the system will be implemented. So let's say you have a company and you have sites. Are you implementing the system all over the place, all sites or in one site or in the head office or in the factory? So it's very important to do that. And then we have the processes that we need to have in place. So these are 4.1, 4.2, and 4.4. Close number five, leadership and worker participation. Here, in close number five, and, and other standards is only leadership. Here they say leadership and worker participation to emphasize the importance of worker. And by the way, who is worker? Worker is everyone working under the control of the organization and anyone entering the premises of the organization. And by the way, top management is a worker. So we have to understand that workers comes from top management down. So we cannot say that the top manager is not a worker. Yeah, the top manager is a top manager, but the top manager, he or she is a worker in the organization. If there's a fire in the organization and the top manager in his office or her office, they have to escape, they have to evacuate. So like any other person. So the same way we train uh, workers, employees, we have to train top managers. So in, in many organizations we audit, when we see the training plan for the people, so they train everyone on, for example, how, how to evacuate the place if there's a fire. And you notice that they have not trained the top manager. Why? Isn't the top manager a person that need to evacuate if there's a fire? They need to evacuate if there's a fire. If they are not trained and if they don't know where to go, if they don't know where is the assembly point, how are they going to evacuate the place? There will be then a, a, a problem. There will be then a burden on the organization and then the health and safety team, the rescue team would have to look for them and rescue them, which is wasting of time. But if they are trained like, like any other one, then they can know what to do and they go and execute what they have learned and what they have been trained on. So this is a very important issue. A lot of organizations, when we audit them on occupational health and safety management system, we see that, uh, that problem, that flaw, that Top management are not trained on hazards and are not trained on emergency situations and they don't know what to do if there is an emergency because, well, they are top management. Well, it doesn't mean they know everything. So clause number five is leadership and uh, worker participation. It has 5.1 leadership and commitment. 5.2 occupation health and safety, organization roles, responsibility, authorities, consultancy, participation of workers, 5.4. You see, this is 5.4 in health and safety or standard ISO 45001. You will not see it in other management system standards. For example, the quality management standard, you have 5.1, 5.2, 5.3. There is no 5.4. But in occupation health and safety management system, 5.4 is there. So leadership and commitment, we need to make sure leaders in the organization, top management, they are committed to health and safety. And commitment be, will be shown by setting policies and objectives and by providing resources, providing resources and implementing the system and make sure the system is integrated within the business processes and it's part of your business plan. When we say it's, it's that uh, top management shall make sure that the health and safety system is integrated with the other business processes. It means when they put their business plan, their strategy, one of their strategy is health and safety system. So when they make a business plan for the next five years or three years, a strategy for the next three, four years, we must see in, a, in that business plan a section on occupation health and safety management system. So that's very important. 
Now, as an uh, auditor, when we audit people, we, try, we ask them, is this part of your strategy? And we see how they make sure that it's part of the strategy. And then who's accountable for the system is the top management. Then we put a policy. In the policy, the policy shall be very important. The policy provides a statement of intent in relation to occupations and safety, supports strategic direction of the organization, and the policy shall have a commitment to prevent injury and ill health. Pay, pay attention to this. The policy shall have a commitment to prevent injury and ill health. So prevention of injury and ill health, not correcting, not fixing it. So we don't wait until there's an injury and we go and attend to that injury and try to fix it. Fix it. So no, we do prevention. We have a system that will prevent injuries and prevent ill health. And then a commitment for continued improvement and commitment to satisfy legal and other requirements in the organization, all the obligations that we have to do. Organizations, role, responsibilities, and authorities. Here we are talking about roles, responsibilities, authorities in regards to occupational health and safety management system, not in regards to day-to-day -day operation. For example, if an, a person get injured in the in the organization, who is who has the responsibility, who has the role, and who's authorized to go and attend to that person who's injured, who's going to treat them, who's going to take the person out of the work and take probably to, could be small injury, first aid. It could be major injury. You have to take the, employee, the worker to the hospital. Who will do that in the organization? These are roles, responsibilities, and authorities different from the roles we do on a daily basis in our work. These are roles, responsibilities, and authorities related to health and safety. If we need to uh, help someone, if there is evacuation, who will do the evacuation? If there is a fire, who will fight the fire? If there is a spill, who will fight the spill? And so on. So that's very important, okay? And we make sure that the people that are in charge are those that are present. Uh, example, uh, in one company I was auditing, they have a first aid kit, you know, the first aid cabinet, and uh, it has a key. And when I was auditing the company, I asked them, who has the key? And they said, the plant manager. And where is the plant manager? He's out for a meeting. So I, was, I said, so if something, someone would need first aid now, how you do it? You don't have the key. So usually roles, responsibilities, authorities for health and safety are supposed to be with people in the plant, in the place, not with the manager who might be outside. What do I need with the manager outside and he has the key of the first aid cabinet and someone is injured and we cannot open it, then we, can, we have to break it then. Why do we need to break it? Give the key to someone who can use it, all right? So that's very important to understand here that we're talking about roles, responsibilities, and authorities. So when we do this, it's very important to understand that, okay? Uh, worker participation and consultation, as I said earlier at the beginning, that employees and workers, they have three rights, the right to know and the right to participate. Here, the right to participate, they participate in setting the policy, participate in setting the objectives, participate in setting the uh, structure, uh, okay, participate in uh, verifying that the system is working, participate in inspection, the uh, place and making sure that all hazards are identified. So that's very important. They participate and identify hazards, assess the risk of those hazards, and assess and uh, identify controls for those hazards. This is very important for the workers to do. And we consult with them uh, and we communicate with the worker for what we are doing. Planning section six action to address this opportunity and then. Uh, objectives and planning to achieve them. So action to address risk and opportunity, we need to look at section four, uh, context of the organization, needs on, uh, of interested parties, and see if there's any issue that will become a risk for the organization. Then we have to identify hazards and risk. So identifying risk and opportunity, what are the sources of risk or threat? What could happen, where, when, how, and why causes, business consequences of the risk, business area stakeholders affected, and what control exists. In this standard, they have two sections, one for identifying risk and assess them and put control for the risks, and one for identifying hazards 
and identify risk related to hazard. So there are two types of hazard risks here, risk related to health and safety, that we need to identify them by identifying the source of that risk, meaning the hazards, physical, chemical, ergonomic, botanical, uh, biological, psychosocial hazards. And the other type of risk is the business risk that may lead to health and safety risk that we need to also identify in the organization. A risk identification techniques, brainstorming, interviews, checklists, structure what if technique, scenario analysis, full tree analysis, bow tie analysis, direct observation, incident surveys, uh, analysis survey. So we have many techniques that we can use to identify the hazards and the risk in any activity in any process, all right? And it's very important to identify the hazard and risk and to, because this is the first step. And if this is not done properly, the identification of the hazard and risk, then the system will not work properly. So action to address risk and opportunity, as I said, this is business risk. And then uh, hazard identification and assessment of risk and opportunity. Uh, the, so again, we have seen this before, but again, we identify the hazard, we identify the people at risk, we assess the risk, we have the control, and we record and communicate. So here, when we do the assessment of risk, we need to have something called uh, hazard and risk uh, matrix, risk assessment matrix. So we will identify the likelihood of the uh, risk happening and the consequences if it happened. So here they have five levels, rare, unlikely, moderate, likely, almost certain, and the consequences, insignificant, minor, moderate, major, catastrophic. So basically, when we make a risk matrix, and that's what we call the risk criteria, the likelihood, when I say a risk or a hazard, is rarely rare to happen. Rare means what? We need to identify that rare. Is it once every year? It's once every month? It's once every 100 years? All right? So that's very important to identify that. Unlikely. What does it mean, unlikely? Once every year, once every 10 years, once every 100 years, and almost certain, maybe daily. Insignificant consequences. Significant in terms of health and safety, meaning probably first aid. So that's an insignificant injury or illness that would need probably just uh, first aid. That's insignificant. Minor injury, probably an injury that will probably put the employee like, like one day or two days off work, all right? Uh, moderate injury, probably we need to stay one week out of work or maybe we we'll go to hospital. Major injury could be irreversible injury. Now, moderate could be reversible injury and major is Irreversible injury. You cut a finger, for example, you lose an eye. So that's major injury. That's irreversible injury. Catastrophic injury, uh, catastrophic uh, consequences meaning death or fatality. So we have to define those insignificant, minor, moderate, major, catastrophic in terms of health and safety. And we, we have to identify the likelihood in terms of what is the frequency of likelihood is probability for something happen happening in addition to the exposure. Pay attention, likelihood in English doesn't mean probability in French, all right, or an Arabic ahtimer. So likelihood is, the, is a combination between probability, frequency of things happening, and the uh, exposure, how the, the frequency of exposure to something. How often are we exposed to a hazard? So that we need to define uh, and then the consequences need to be defined. Uh, occupation health and safety objectives and planning. By the way, this is the most important part of the standard and the work. This is the uh, health and safety uh, hazard identification, risk identification, risk assessment. This is, must be done properly because if this is done properly, everything else will be done properly because from this we will know who is responsible to do what, from this we will put the controls, from this we will put the objective and so on. Objectives and planning, so we need to set objectives, occupational health and safety objectives, uh, reducing uh, injuries, preventing injuries, reducing injuries, preventing ill health, uh, reducing Ill illness, and re reducing uh, lost time and whatsoever, those are the objectives that we need to in place. Improve your performance, evaluate performance, health and safety performance. Close seven support. We have resources, competence, awareness, communication, documented information. Resources, what resources you need 
to manage our health and safety study organization. So we we'll need people, we we'll need infrastructure, we we'll need the work environment, we we'll need all kinds of resources. We we'll, we'll need to put probably, uh, we, uh, we may have a resource, might need to have a nurse in the organization. We might need to have a doctor in the organization, depending how big is the organization and what type of risk we have. So usually resources are people, part of people could be a nurse, could be, uh, could be a small entity, uh, first uh, primary, health, uh, primary health office, for example, in the organization, depending how big is the organization, depending where is the organization. Let's imagine, for example, you have an organization that's like 100 kilometers far from a hospital and something happened to a worker and, and you have to put that worker uh, in the hospital. So 100 kilometers could be very uh, late to get to the hospital and the person might die. So in this case, I might need a specific resource in the hospital and in, in the organization like a doctor, like a nurse, like a resources like first aid, like not only first aid, like probably defibrillator in the organization. Uh, if there's a heart attack, you cannot afford to wait to go to, uh, to the hospital in 100 kilometers. So you might need to put a defibrillator in the uh, organization. You might need to have a small uh, clinic or whatsoever. So it depends on where you are. It depends on the risk. It depends on the uh, companies, for example, working in the desert, working and oil and gas uh, business. So they are far from hospitals. So they might need to have a small hospital, a small uh, primary health care and the organization dispenser or whatever. So it's very important to understand. Resources here are linked to health and safety issues. So we are going, once we identify hazards, once we identify risks and we need controls, then, then we, the control could be all right, I need, uh, I need something related to health here in the organization. So I may need permanent people in the organization, nurses or whatever, to help. Okay? What rescue team? These are all resources that you might need to put in place. Okay? So that's very important to understand what resources. Part of resources, for example, PPEs, personal protective equipment. Okay? Masks, what gloves. Uh, all these things that you need to put, safety shoes, say helmet, and whatsoever. These are all resources that you need to put in place to manage your health and safety uh, system. Competence. You need people that are competent in dealing with incidents. We need people to be competent in doing their day-to-day -day work. But when we are implementing health and safety management system, you want to make sure that people are competent in dealing with incidents. So. Who is going to deal with an incident? If there is a fire, who is going to fight the fire? Are they trained? Are they competent in doing that? Okay. If there is someone who uh, has, is injured, who is going to attend to this person? So we need to make sure that we have competence related to the occupational health and safety that we might have in place. Awareness, we need to make sure that everyone is aware of the system and their, uh, what are the hazards hazard in place. They know the, the hazard, they know the risk. They know their procedures, they know their policy, they know they, uh, they have been trained, aware of evacuation and whatsoever. And what are the consequences? They know what are the consequences if they are not implementing that. For example, a lot of people, you give them, for example, PPE, hearing protection. They have to, there is noise in the organization. They have to be made aware that if you don't use it, you're going to lose your hearing capabilities. You are going to be deaf. And we have to show them that, okay? That's very important. Communication, you communicate the policy, the objectives, the legal requirements, the hazard, the risk, internally and externally, we communicate. And we have documented information, all the system is documented in the organization. So that's the section seven. Section eight, uh, clause eight is the operation. So in the operation, you have 8.1, operational planning and control, consider, Nature of business, operation, processes, product and services, policy and objective, risk and opportunity, operation hazard and level of risk, legislation, obligation, potential changes, management of change, uh, industry practices. So when you put con uh, controls, most of the controls are identified when we do the hazard identification and the risk assessment. When we identify the hazard, assess the risk, and then we put controls. On those controls, they are supposed to be in place. So how we deal with every incident.
and hierarchy of controls in the organization. First control is eliminate the hazard. So if there's a hazard, if we, I, I can eliminate the hazard, that will be nice. Not, it's not always possible to eliminate the hazard. Eliminate the hazard, meaning eliminate the source of the risk. So probably it could be that don't do the job or change the way you're doing the job. Substitute the hazard. So substitution, so for example, if I use a chemical in the organization, which is oil based, I can change it with a chemical water based. That's substitute. Substitute raw materials, substitute operation processes, and whatsoever. So eliminate hazard, substitute hazard, isolate hazard. There's a, a part of engineering control could be, and sometimes we we'll put it separately. Isolate the hazard. So some hazards could be isolated in one area that only specific people can go to that area. Another uh, hierarchy of control, engineering controls, guards, local exhaust ventilation, reorganization of work, administrative controls, signage, instructions, warning, training, restructuring, and PPA, bottom of hierarchy, personnel protective equipment. Here there is a very important issue. You, you're all hearing today, for example, because of COVID-19, that we need PPEs. Okay, that's good. But this is the last thing you do in protecting workers. And it cannot be used alone. PPE alone will not prevent hazard and will not prevent risk. PPEs are used with the other controls, elimination, substitution, isolation, engineering control, administrative control. We use those and we use with them PPEs. So when, for example, government will tell people, go back to work and make sure you have PPE, that's not enough. You need to have PPE, personnel protective equipment, okay, like masks, like gloves, like harness, harness, like, like safety shoes, like uh, uh, hearing protection. Okay, all these things are important. Guns and whatsoever, these are important, but they cannot operate alone. This is the last resort. This is the last line of defense, PPE. They have to be used with the other controls, with elimination, with substitution, with isolation, with engineering control, with administrative control. If they are not used with those, they will not alone save people. So pay, pay attention. A lot of companies we audit and a lot of people will talk to, oh, don't worry, we are protecting our employees, they have PPEs. Okay, that PPE is not enough, okay? So that's very important, okay? So we need to make sure that PPE is used with other things. Management of change is part of the operation. We have to have a procedure of managing change, why we do changes, objective of changes, and how we inform people about changes, and how we convince people about changes, and how we implement change. Procurement, part of the health and safety system is procurement, because we buy a lot of things to our operation, a lot of raw materials, a lot of equipment, a lot of machines. We have to make sure those are safe, those are healthy. So those will not cause injuries and those will not cause illness to employees when we do contractors and outsourcing. We might have contractors working on our premises. We might outsource some activities. We need to make sure they are protected. Point two, emergency preparedness and response. We have to make sure we identify all emergency situations, okay, in terms of health and injuries, and we have a response to them. We are ready, prepared for every single emergency you have an action plan, that's the response. So if the emergency happened, you implement your action plan, your response, so that emergency will not cause harm to you. Performance evaluation, you monitor and measure and analyze your controls, your objectives, your policy, okay? And you do internal audit and you do management review on your system. And then the last one is the uh, continuing improvement, incident investigation, non-conformity and corrective action, and then continual improvement. Uh, any question? That's the summary of it. So if you have any question, please feel free to say. Uh, sorry, could you uh, repeat uh, uh, all the issues regarding the COVID-19 uh, uh, issues solved before? Uh, you mean with the regarding the PPE that is it is not enough? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You see, you see, uh, COVID nineteen or any type of risk. COVID nineteen is a risk, like any other risk. Okay, it's a higher risk, very dangerous risk. But if you go and just have in the organization PPEs, okay, and you don't have, for example, cleaning, 
if you don't have housekeeping, if you don't have a hygiene system, PPE will not help you, all right? So you enter the place and you have gloves and you have masks. Okay, but the, the place is dirty. It's not okay. disinfected. So what the PPE will do for you? Nothing, right? So you need All a right. system, you identify what can cause, what type of business you have, what surface you have, what walls you have, okay? What windows you have, what doors you have, okay? All these things could be a source of the disease. So having the PPE mm -hmm. is not going to help you. It's just a one way of supporting, all right? So we need to make sure that, okay, PPE and there's no distance, no physical distancing. PPE and the, the offices are very crowded. What do you do with the PPE? We will not have, right. So we have to make sure that there's a system in place, not only PPE, all right? Oh, okay, I'm protected, I'm, I'm putting a mask. Okay, do you know how often you need to change the mask? Do you know how often you need to do you know how often you need to change the gloves you are wearing so okay you use the mask forever if you use it for two days it's not good anymore so is there a system in place to identify that that control to say okay use of mask that mask and what type of mask you are using and depending on the organization you have okay so then a system that will say okay the mask must be changed every uh, once every two days okay and we need to manage that. So we issue masks to employees. We have a list of employees who had the mask. When did we give it to them? When we need to go and take it from them and give them a new one? That's a system. That's not a PPE, all right? So you manage right. that. That's very important to understand the difference between PPEs and the management system. And that's what government is not telling people. And that's what they are lacking. Go back to work. Yeah, go back to work. Based on what? Or take, be careful. What do you mean be careful? It's a very generic word. Be careful. We like, uh, take all the precautions. What precautions I need to take? Do we have a checklist? Do we have, have the government prepared a checklist, for example, a list of things that you need to go to do and gave it to people? Depending on the industry, you are construction, you are uh, factory, you are uh, restaurant, you are hospital, so pharmacy. So every industry must have a kind of a list of things to be done so they can be protected from the COVID-19. Not only uh, just give them uh, PPE. That doesn't work with PPE only. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, of course, if you have any questions, we will hear you. Just wanted to share with you that, that if you want to have more information about the standard, we are offering a one-day online course uh, next week on May 19, it's a Tuesday, for a discounted fee. I will send you the information just in case you are interested. Okay. Thank Perfect. you very much. Yeah, thank you. You are all welcome. If you have any more questions, please let us know. Okay, thank you very much, guys, and hopefully you enjoyed the session and uh, it was informative for you. We did not waste your time. And we hope to see you in another flight, <laughs> in another session. Thank you, Asim. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Sir. You are welcome. Okay, guys. You are welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.